I think we've had a very interesting discussion this, uh, this afternoon with uh, the former Commissioner um, John Fenley and the way in which uh, our <coughs> corrections and mental health systems overlap. Um, we didn't drill down too far into the specific incidences of um, receiving mental health treatment in uh, uh, prison and certainly there is some scuttlebutt to the effect that you can receive far more effective um, treatment or at least far greater access to mental health treatment once you are deprived of your liberty and committed to a correctional facility. Now, whether or not that is in fact correct, uh, I would say is somewhat debatable, but certainly there are people who are receiving mental health treatment in prison, whether they are in the general system or in our forensic hospitals. Um, and there are legislative provisions which relate to the rights of carers under the Mental Health Act that have some relevance to what goes on in a jail, sometimes, and sometimes not. And it's a very murky area. So this is why we felt that, given that we are preparing to provide input into the review of the Forensic Provisions, Mental Health Forensic Provisions Act, we good to inform ourselves and other carers about some of the details how that works. For that reason, we asked the official visitors if they could provide us with a speaker uh, of someone who has a perspective looking at how those systems actually mesh together or don't quite mesh together effectively. And they have provided us with Meryl Edwards, a very experienced official visitor, and we're very grateful to have her here today. Meryl has been an official visitor for about 14 years and is also an official visitor <coughs> under the, the Drug and Alcohol Treatment Act. Working in mental health and becoming an OV is in fact her third career. She started out in journalism and communications, then after an MBA has moved into New South Wales Health Planning and Policy Department, then on retirement became a consultant and an official visitor. And as with everyone here today, she continues to support family and friends with mental health issues. So I'd like you to make Meryl Edwards very welcome to you. Thank you very much, and um, it's a great privilege to be here today with, uh, with you all on behalf of mental health uh, official visitors across the state. And uh, so I thought I'd talk by um, uh, about the Act and what official visitors are and what we do and why we're here. So there may be um, some surprise at what powers we have and there may be some disappointment about some powers that we don't have, particularly in the forensic context. So uh, we're not appointed under the um, Forensic Provisions Act, but under the Mental Health Act itself. And you'd probably be aware there are other official visitors as well. There are. Um, community official visitors who support people with intellectual <coughs> disabilities and there are of course prison official visitors and we do occasionally have contact with those other organisations and we do also sometimes communicate with uh, the official visitors in other states and so every state now does have mental health official visitors. South Australia was the last to come on board a few years back um, but it's quite a venerable institution and uh, we were established in New South Wales under one of the first pieces of legislation in about 1847, uh, building on the English model. And it, it came about as a result of the terrible um, conditions in institutions there, um, where not people do, with mental illness only, but all manner of people were confined in terrible conditions. And uh, so some, uh, uh, what would you say, uh, philanthropic citizens, uh, applied pressure to have a doctor and the magistrate given the power to enter these institutions and they could in fact um, uh, release somebody if they thought that they were being wrongfully held there. So things have changed. We've got the Mental Health Review Tribunal these days and official visitors might have a background um, in a clinical area such as psychology or nursing or social work or they might be um, have a background as um, a consumer who's well, a carer, or somebody like myself who's worked in mental health service provision. So 
so there's a lot of diversity. Um, a lot of us are um, older people like myself because it's a part-time kind of position and you need a lot of flexibility to travel and uh, go at different times. So um, although we do love to have younger people, it's usually not consistent with a full-time career. So, uh, so a lot of us are forced to, to have the uh, experience and, and ability. So, uh, You'll see quite a lot of um, grey hairs. In fact, someone unkindly described us as the cast of new tricks, but <laughs> we don't take that to heart. Uh, <coughs> right. Should be the right wall. Yes? No? Oh. Going the wrong way. Oh, no. A second. Let's go back the other way. Let me put it back on the slideshow. <coughs> it should be the. Um, oh, the one, huh? Yeah, it should be the right button to go right. And if you want to go back to the left. Okay, so this is what the Act says we're for. So I just thought I'd put that up there so you could see. Um, and uh, I won't go into that in great detail, but I'll move on to um, what that um, actually means. So uh, it talks about referring, and uh, so that's a lot of what we do. We, um, we take issues that um, can't be resolved between us and the patient and the carer and the immediate treating team and uh, take that up the line to the more senior level in the organisation or the local health district and, uh, and, and as high as it needs to go to get somebody who has the authority to either determine or resolve that issue for the person. Uh, we also are interested in the systemic issues because we visit every uh, uh, mental health unit visual visitors have a kind of unique perspective on what goes on on the ground in all those units and so and obviously we confer from time to time and we might become aware that there's an issue for example with um, the way ECT is administered that there aren't proper protocols or there are particular issues and so uh, we would bring that to the attention of the minister or New South Wales Health or whoever the appropriate body was. Um, advocacy is very important and uh, specifically mentioned in the Act something that official visitors should be doing. Um, and so we do that both um, in terms of individuals. So if a patient um, asks us about something, tells us something, raises an issue, or if we observe something, we can advocate for that patient. And similarly, if a carer brings it to our attention. Um, we can also join other voices in improving the health system, such as Carers New South Wales, <laughs> to. Um, to bring about changes, possibly legislative changes as well. Um, and we usually, um, as an organisation, uh, put in submissions if there's a review of legislation or something like that going on. Uh, the other part of what we're supposed to do is inspect. Um, so that means that we're looking at documents and um, patient records, we're looking for accuracy, we're looking for compliance with legal issues. Um, we're looking to see if the patient is receiving appropriate treatment and care, and that could cover a whole range of things to, as to access to therapeutic programs or um, whether their wishes are being heard in regard to medication and so forth. And we also look at the physical environment. Um, so is it safe? Is it clean? Um, we hear a lot about food, usually that it's not very good. <laughs> and uh, of course we're a bit limited in what we can do about that since um, mostly it's privately contracted. Um, so wait a minute, have I skipped one? Yeah, I've, gone back and I've gone back and sort of forward. No, I'm going the wrong way now. I've no, gone no, way too fast. There we go. So what do we, where do we go? There's about 90 of us across the state. And um, so uh, some people, like people in rural areas, might only visit one or two facilities because of uh, geographical remoteness. Um, and others, uh, metropolitan ones like myself, would visit a number of facilities. And uh, we visit um, every gazetted one, and gazetted's important, I'll come back to that. So it's public and private, it's community for patients who are on community treatment orders, um, inpatients, emergency departments, because they're now gazetted as well, most, not all of them, but most of them, and, uh, and the PEC units. And official visitors um, coming closer to our concerns today visit forensic patients. And so uh, I'm a forensic official visitor myself. And uh, so uh, we visit the units at Long Bay, 
um, the aged care unit and the F and G. We visit all the units <coughs> in the forensic hospital there that's co-located. And we also see uh, forensic patients in other facilities in the medium secure setting, so like Cumberland, Morrisset and Bloomfield, and, uh, and sometimes at other places like Macquarie they may have a forensic patient. Um, so we don't visit silver water, and there's quite a, sometimes quite a lot of issues that arise between patients that have been in silver water and come to the forensic hospital or whatever, but silver water is not a gazetted facility, and so we have no authority to visit there. Right, we'll get the arrow going in the right direction. So, this is um, what the Act says that we should be doing. And um, I'll come on to the bit later with uh, the reporting, because the reporting is an important part of what we do. No, I've gone the wrong way again. Yeah, so we talked about the inspecting, and that patients have a lot of concern with their environment naturally because they're stuck in hospital it's it's boring um, carers also have a lot of issues with the situation they find themselves in so if the tv breaks down for example it always seems to take forever for, the, for anything to be done to fix those sorts of things and yet it's a lifeline for the patients to uh, have some communication with the outside world and have some diversion and entertainment you know um, so uh, sometimes the furniture is really shabby, torn, damaged, you know. So um, a lot of those things we can push hard on those and you know, we're often told, well, we put in an order, but you know, that was six months ago and the maintenance hasn't been done, whatever. So that's a situation where we would escalate that up the line. <coughs> um, our most important thing in terms of the inquiring, obviously, is, is to listen to patients. And so that's usually... Um, a typical visit, we'd arrive, we'd check in with the nurse unit manager, make sure that um, the, uh, the unit is functioning, if there's anything in particular that they need to tell us before we do the visit, and we talk to patients. We look at the incident reports to uh, see if the, what's been going on, how incidents were dealt with, um, and particularly we also look at uh, the involvement of carers in the, in the care of people and make sure that they have are current care for on their file, whether it's electronic or otherwise. And uh, we talk about the issues. We look a lot at programs to, uh, as to whether the people are actually being provided with something which will help them to get well, rather than just being locked up for a long time. And the forensic hospital has um, a certain number of programs um, in um, the Rong Bay area, less less so, and, and of great concern is to us there is how long people stay locked in their cells every day, which is hardly therapeutic. Uh, and we observe, and so that means that we ask a lot of questions of the staff, which may or may not be well received, and we make comments, and we provide a report um, each month after our visit to the staff. And the staff, um, you know, it may not just be the nurse unit manager, it might concern the social worker or a senior manager um, or the consultant as to what it is that we're observing or questioning. And, uh, and they are obliged to reply to us um, and uh, satisfy us that um, we don't need to investigate or take it further. Or if we do, um, we we'll take it up with somebody higher up in the system. And that report that we do each month goes to the principal official visitor, um, along with some other observations that we might make about issues uh, relating to that facility um, or about a particular patient's situation. And, uh, and if necessary, those issues are escalated to the minister if, it, if it's an individual one. In a generic way, the principal official visitor meets with the minister regularly, so we've got a relatively new minister, as you all know. And uh, so our principal official visitor, Karen Lenahan, um, arranges meetings with her about every quarter and talks about what it is that we're seeing in the system where we think um, issues lie and what might be done to resolve them. <coughs> so we do have that direct line to the minister. Uh, we also have regular meetings with um, New South Wales Health about um, matters of concern. Uh, the health system, uh, guidelines and policies that health might need to put out, uh, observations about whether, for example, um, uh, a new policy like seclusion and restraint is being um, implemented correctly, whether staff are familiar with it, 
um, whether they have easy access to it because uh, a lot of it now being um, electronically provided, it's always interesting to ask staff um, if they know about such and such policy, they may well say yes, and then if you ask them to show you the policy um, in their own system, they can't locate it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of um, education needed for staff. So um, carers, well, um, you all know about that. Uh, the, um, the Mental Health Act specifically provides for a relationship between official visitors and carers. And, um, the, the, um, you, you know all that information about principal care providers and designated carers, I'm sure. So we look to see who the carers are when we look. And so how do we relate to forensic um, carers? Well, generally it's over the phone. It's great when we happen to meet someone when we're visiting the forensic hospital. But uh, it's quite rare, I have to say, that we would uh, be there at the time that somebody is visiting someone. And, uh, and also, I have to say, it doesn't seem that visits are all that common in the forensic hospital either. And I can understand that in a way because it's such a performance to, um, to get in to visit someone. Um, we really like meeting carers if we go to a special event there, like Mental Health Week or NADOC, which I see I've spelt wrongly. <laughs> <laughs> And we also, um, I don't know how many of you would know Erica Balance. Uh, she's the uh, family and carer consultant at the Forensic Hospital. She's great and she always um, buttonholes us and tells us um, all the latest things when we see her. Um, so the main thing is um, the lifeline between us and you um, is the phone line. And so um, I don't know how many of you are aware that the phone line exists. But that's the way to get in touch with someone and, uh, and to talk to us about what it is that is concerning you and to see if there's something that we can assist with or advocate for. So um, the Act provides to, um, for us to talk to you. And so it, um, you, can, you can ask to see us. You can do that through the facility if you want to, but it's, it's probably just easier to ring the phone line and take it from there. We will check to see if you're a designated carer, and that becomes relevant in the light of the next part, which I've gone too far again. Um, what about this chair? Just one well, I'll just speak to the, the best thing is, is that if somebody um, uh, rings us on the phone line, as they may do, and they say, I'm um, you know, Fred Smith and uh, my relative uh, Joan Smith is in such and such a situation and this is what I'm concerned about, can you help? Um, we'll listen to what that person has to say, but we will ask them um, as to whether they, they are the designated care of the person and they may say yes or no. If they say no, then we will explain that um, we can't provide them with any information about the patient, um, but we can hear their concerns and we can pursue them, but we can't tell them the result of that inquiry. Um, if they say yes, they are a carer, we say fine, we'll look into it, and we do check with the facility then to see if in fact that is the truth, that they are we get the staff to check to see whether that person is that is a designated care because otherwise we would be breaching the confidentiality of the patient if we provided <coughs> information. So it's not out of bounds for people to ask. Do you hear much from principal care providers nominated by the treating team for a person who makes capacity? Not so much. I mean, it, it's um, occasionally, but, but it's mostly the designated <coughs> care. Um, and it's quite common for the person to not have that legal status at all, but to be a concerned friend or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, we value those calls because it often gives us an insight as to what's happening with the patient. Um, but, um, but as I say, we can't feed, feed back to the person, but we certainly appreciate you know, any information that they're given that help us to assist the, uh, the patient. So, uh, so no, not, not usually. It's, it's, um, I, yeah, we do encounter that. <coughs> so some of the things that um, we have worried about um, in recent times, obviously 
least restrictive care. I mentioned at the time that um, patients are kept in their cells in the in Long Bay. Um, and as John mentioned earlier, you know, there are not enough medium secure places in the community for people to move on, so they're stuck in the system for years. Um, there are people in the prison system waiting for a bed in the forensic hospital as well. Um, it's particularly a problem for uh, at the forensic hospital for the women um, who are in the same unit for the duration of their stay. The men have the possibility of moving through a range of units. Um, while they're in the forensic hospital, but the women know there's nowhere for them to go, so they're stuck in the same one for a very long time before they get a place. Um, things seem to have moved a bit better in recent years, I think, with uh, the women going to Bunya. <coughs> but, um, but it's still a very long stay, and as John mentioned, they're, they're quite often um, still stuck there when they reach the point of readiness to move, but there's nowhere to move to. Um, the uh, seclusion practices are of a concern sometimes. You know, there are some, uh, some violent incidents um, and uh, the, result, the resulting seclusions can be very detrimental to the patient's mental health and some patients at Forensic Hospital have been in seclusion for a long time and so we've certainly advocated for them very strenuously over the years for alternatives um, one of the things I know that the Forensic Hospital did was to engage the Project Air consultants um, to assist the staff to um, be perhaps more empathetic, to manage situations a bit better so that um, they don't necessarily result in a you know, seclusion. And they've looked at some other uh, practices as well. Um, access to education and computers, again, for people in the uh, forensic system. Um, they get quite out of touch with technological advances and it's very difficult and sometimes quite um, confronting for them to uh, have to deal with something as simple as ATM transactions. Um, and so we're always advocating for access to um, education um, and also computer, just general computer use for, uh, for patients. And I know again that uh, Justice Health is looking at a, a secure system which will address their concerns about um, <coughs> internet privacy and security, but will still enable the, uh, the patients to, to use computers. Uh, a lot of people find themselves in the justice health system and uh, they may come from a non-English speaking background and so they struggle with communication daily. Um, there's very little offered in general for them to learn to speak English. Um, and there's also, um, I've said literary, but I actually mean literacy <laughs> courses because uh, some of the patients um, uh, have struggle even with, uh, with reading and writing and there's very minimal provision of those things. Um, we also, um, there's also all, all sorts of issues around um, financial matters. Um, some patients have a, a, um, a public uh, trustee arrangement uh, but there's been all sorts of contentious things, as I'm sure carers would have heard, about patients having to pay for their accommodation and having a very minimal amount of money left to provide for their personal needs after that uh, money. I think it's about 85% that is taken. <coughs> um, and uh, lastly, and very definitely not least, we've been arguing for something like Skype for um, patients and carers who are um, a long way apart, who can't travel, to be able to communicate. Um, Skype wasn't a goer in their view because it wasn't secure, but they're looking at exit. I don't know how many of you know, but it's like Skype, but it, if you go through a portal, what is secure? And they've actually, at yeah, the forensic hospital, had uh, their first few interviews using Pexit, which is great. Um, so hopefully there'll be, uh, there'll be more of that for people. So, um, so that's basically, um, the kinds of things that we do. I'm happy, happy to discuss the issues that uh, patients raise and the issues that carers raise and encourage you all please to uh, make use of our phone line number um, whenever you feel the need to, um, to talk to someone about your situation and lots of support might be available. So I was just going to ask a, a general question about yep. um, the access of carers to consumers while they're in. Mm -hmm. um, the corrections and whether there's a difference between that access when they're in the forensic hospital as opposed to a, a general correctional facility. And also, are carers engaged at all in any planning around the discharge of 
Um, I think the answer is definitely yes to the second one. Yeah. From what I can see, with uh, certainly with the forensic hospital and also uh, with the prison, there's a lot of planning, obviously, around discharge for security reasons, if for, not for humanitarian ones. Mm. And so, uh, yes, I do see care as being involved in discharge planning uh, in terms of the documents that we see and what we're told by, by patients. Access to patients, I'm not so sure about Long Bay. I have visited there, um, and I know they have restrictions on visiting hours and what you can take in and all the rest of it. It's the same at the forensic hospital. It's quite a performance for a carer to visit in either facility. And, uh, you know, and we certainly we hear some complaints that, for example, at the forensic hospital, people come, they have to wait um, after they pass through security for a staff member to come and get them and escort them to the unit to have their time with the patient. And if there's something going on or with the staff, um, they just wait, you know, and it all leads into their time and are allowed to spend with the patient. So there's quite a lot of issues. There's issues with um, trying to post parcels to people too. They sometimes go astray or they sit for a long time. And that's all good, particularly if you're posting, say, a pair of shoes that turns out they're the wrong size and you've got to take them back, you know, there's, there's a lot of just that infuriating level of detail that people have to deal with all the time. Yeah, then I just asked, being in Parramatta, do, have, are you guys able to get any idea of what's going to happen with the future of Bunya? Because Bunya is within the um, Heritage Corps yes. and they are moving services off the thing. They've also cut some of the psychosocial rehab services within Cumberland because yes. was, um, after, after the nursing unit manager for life school, yeah, life schools, Margaret Bannister, um, passed last March. They haven't Have she replaced her. Mm. Haven't replaced her, and those programs were closed prior to her going on mm. extended sick leave. Um, but the thing is, I know, I'm hearing some positives, but I'm not getting anything. We've been asking questions mm. for six to eight years from six years from health regarding what's the future. Psychiatric services, and they've got no idea. It's yeah. even been asked in Parliament. Yes. No, the short answer is no. We haven't got any inside information on that either. We'd really love to know uh, because you know, we, that's that's the lifeline for uh, for the women in the forensic system. So it's terrible to think that um, we're still sitting here not knowing what's going to happen. We would hope for obviously more more places for them uh, with whatever they're going to do once one is closed. But I don't know. What about housing and things when they come out? They arrange housing or just look back on the streets? No, no, no. There's a there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, I think again the the prison system is different from the forensic hospital. I think there's there's a high level of engagement by the social work staff and the other allied health staff at the forensic hospital. But uh, but in the uh, from corrective services. Um, there are provisions, but from what I understand, they're uh, less thorough and um, perhaps less permanent than, uh, than the sorts of arrangements that are made by the forensic hospital. Are they given priority? With, with, with uh, housing, you mean? <coughs> uh, I think that's a hard question to answer. I, I know that um, housing um, do make provision for, for people. It's, um, I, I'm certainly aware of patients who've been able to move into um, housing New South Wales accommodation, but uh, as you probably know, they seem to have become more um, strict in recent years about the provisions relating to tenants. Uh, they've even been known to uh, discharge tenants if they've been unsatisfactory in some respect, uh, even though that means they're not homeless. So, uh, so it depends, but, but yes, broadly speaking, there's, there is some form of housing or accommodation or supported services put in place before people are discharged, yes. Can I ask how it comes out with the point that it's still in water? Because I know the staff ratio to the amount of mental health patients is very poor there. I know we, we hear that too, but uh, as I was saying earlier, it's not gazetted. So we only have the authority to <coughs> visit places that are gazetted, um, you know, meaning that there's been a, it basically comes down to New South Wales Health, 
um, who look at the situation regarding a particular unit and they decide that yes, it should be gazetted, which has certain rights and responsibilities for that organisation under the Mental Health Act. And so, for example, it's, it's relatively recent that emergency departments were gazetted and that caused a lot of angst amongst emergency department staff to have official visitors coming into ED and if they said we'd get in the way and we'd cause accidents or we'd be attacked or we wouldn't know what was going on and so forth. And so that's all settled down, but that's, oh, I can't remember, maybe five years or so ago, I think, that um, EDs were gazetted. And so that was a, a new step to have official visits there. I mean, Civil War is one of the main, one of the main, yes. And there's a lot of, lot of patients there with, with being treated for, for mental health issues, yes. And so we've, we've uh, suggested many times that perhaps it should be gazetted, but uh, it's not up to us. With um, when um, people who might be experiencing mental illness might even be under the Mental Health Act are on non-gazetted um, facilities, do you have any rights over what happens to them? What sort of facilities are you thinking about? Well, housing. housing. Oh, yeah. Well, I was actually thinking even silver water. We had yeah. a, a carer who was very concerned about her brother who had psychosis um, and a number of other alcohol and drug and mm. other related mental health issues. She found it very difficult to get any information about what was happening to him while he was in Silver War. And it was very difficult for her to provide any kind of assistance. And of course, they weren't really so interested in his mental health. No. They were really more interested in the uh, prosecution that was coming up. No. And so I was just thinking that it seemed to me like the official visitor had very little uh, of the Mental Health Act had yes. very little application for those circumstances. Mm. Yes, and so, sadly, no, we can't. I mean, one would hope that the prison visitors might be willing to step up. Uh, we, we have had liaison with them, and uh, they, I think about two years ago, we had a meeting with their new inspector, I think she's called. Um, and so uh, what prison visitors do is, is somewhat different from what we do, but there's absolutely no reason why they couldn't take up issues of mental health and perhaps they should be approached to assist. You know. But unfortunately in the case of Super Water we can't know. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, can you do any um, advocacy for uh, setting up a system where there's autism screening, mental, you know, within the system? Within the forensic system? Yes. To have that screening process take place, I mean, it should be a part of the person's mental health assessment when they're but it's admitted. Not, you know, it's it's all very general. Mm -hmm. When my son was in in Silver Water, mm -hmm. you know, I was told things like, uh, "Listen, lady, you've got a thousand inmates here. Your son will be seen whenever." Right, and. It is very difficult, as John, uh, Jonathan was saying, it's very difficult to get through to anyone who knows anything or willing to say anything. Yes. And it's like, within the system, you, when you're in there, apparently you put a piece of paper in and someone will come and see you in a few months, maybe. Mm. I think, yeah, I mean, I think from what I hear, there's a lot of issues around that sort of level of care at mm. water. I mean, for example, with the adolescent unit, in the forensic hospital, they all have a thorough psychiatric assessment which would include autism and certainly um, yeah. I see patients there who um, do have a diagnosis, you know, a diagnosis of autism. Um, so how could we set it up? How could we actually change this so that, you know, who is going to do this? Well, just, just as health, uh, I mean, this is one area where we can advocate for this uh, by an indirect route, if you like, yeah. and Justice Health might say, well, Silver Water has um, nothing to do with you, but Justice Health are providing those health services to Silver Water, and, uh, and we've, we've discussed issues about Silver Water with them before. We meet with the Justice Health executive um, every quarter or so to discuss big issues, such as the ones I highlighted, and, uh, and we could certainly bring up that, that issue of the, of the mental health screening and diagnosis for patients at Silver Water, and we can specifically mention autism, I'm happy to do that, right. and um, see where they, where they are willing to take that. Thank you. Meryl, you just, there's an interesting point is, we get sometimes get youth, the under 24s, who may or may not have 
presenting of symptoms but not necessarily diagnosed. And those people who have, these young people who just won't engage in whatever support they've put in place, sometimes the only way is for them to go to forensic. I had a care I ran into on Australia Day. Um, the young man wouldn't engage in treatment despite having a treating team wouldn't take his medication, ended up coming in front of a legal magistrate for something else. And they said, well, if you don't connect, you're going to have to come in to be incarcerated. Mm. Why do we have to get... I'd love to see a way of a stepping way of avoiding that. Um, to, to, and he was under the public health and the parents were pulling their hair out saying, why do we have to go down this way? I know one of the ex-vice um, presidents um, Irene from One Door said, why do juvenile, and she's very much big about this, why do people have to get a juvenile record yes. to actually just get a diagnosis? Yes. <laughs> How old was this person? Uh, one of them was a 16, but he was six foot something, right. disengaged from school. The other one was the last, that was 14, 15. Um, Red Bank would even take her on because right. simply because she wouldn't engage. Um, She's now, she'll be just 18 this year, but she's in destructive behaviour. Parents, she actually got charged because they wouldn't, for, that, um, for assault, because they wouldn't contain, she couldn't come under the Mental Health Act of Kids. Mm -hmm. And this is a couple of years ago, and I was trying to work out, well, can I help, or where do I help? Mum was playing yes. through me, through text messages, through a friend I met her. Yes, girls off the, off the planet, very unwell but trying to get her engaged. She had the best private care that she could possibly get, but she just would not engage in treat, any type of treatment. Mm. I'm not sure how that, well, I mean, once the person becomes an adult, then one imagines that the alternative path would be an involuntary admission yeah. to a mental health unit. If there were, but, um, but it is difficult with, uh, it's, we don't so often see younger people involuntarily admitted. Uh, but it does happen. Uh, uh, there would have to be circumstances where, um, you know, the child and adolescent unit was willing to, um, you know, it's it too headspace, too complex. Yeah. I suppose sometimes uh, there can be difficulties in um, reaching a person about their mental health, and yeah. sometimes it does take an involuntary event, yes. either an admission or, uh, unfortunately, a, an arrest and a prosecution. Mm -hmm. And it would at least be comforting to know that if there was an arrest that there would be a detailed mm. assessment that resulted in action being taken mm. in on behalf of that person's mental health and it's not entirely clear that that always happens mm. always happens in a timely fashion no that's right yeah. i mean you'd like to see more yeah. di more court diversion programs to that's divert right. people into mental health care rather than uh, the prison system that would be a huge part of our submission i can just tell already. good that's true so look we're coming towards the end of our time, and I'm just wondering if there's any last quick question that you might have to put to Meryl about this. Otherwise, we will have the opportunity, no doubt, to of course. talk later. Yes. And I can see that there's lots of rich material for us. But I'd like to, uh, if there's no one else, thank Meryl very much for a very informative and insightful um, talk. There's certainly a number of flavour of visitors that I wasn't aware of and that we're keen to take up exploring further what mutual work we can do together with prison visitors yeah. and so on. Right. Okay, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.